Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be in Tokyo. When Mohammed Bouazizi set himself on fire in December 2010, he struck a chord. For the first time, people willing to take their own future in their own hands and to start writing their own history. It's a revolt that was initiated by people with no political history. If one looks back at the, at the, um, the developments over the last year, in particularly in Egypt, what one sees is that uh, is several things. First of all, there is a look towards Turkey as a model. Turkey in many ways is a model probably in that it is an, an Islamic, a democratically elected Islamist government with an, uh, that until now has produced an economic success story. It's also a model in which there is a degree in which the military has been brought under civilian control and in which there is a degree of cooperation between uh, the military there is, uh, as well as um, the Islamist forces and other players in, in the democracy. In Egypt, the picture was very different. So the military has, right, you know, understandably so, significant interests in what the new Egypt will look like. Some governments have been able to uh, reduce, at least temporarily reduce, the prospect of pro protests. I think more equally importantly is that a lot of people are looking at Syria and the bloodshed that is taking place there. It's not something that people wish upon themselves. They are looking at Egypt, which is a messy transition, and they want to see what happens. I think it would be wrong to conclude from that that the, the wind is out of the sails of the, of the Arab revolt. I'm not sure I would call it an Arab Spring. And I'll conclude with this. This is going to be a long and drawn out process. That it will move on, I have no doubt about. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I'd like to begin, of course, by thanking the Foundation. Since the subject that we've chosen is uh, Singapore's perspective on the Arab Spring, uh, allow me to perhaps begin by expanding the uh, uh, domain of inquiry a bit further. I'd like to, if I may, uh, address the question of how Southeast Asia uh, looks at the Arab Spring. I would argue that the highest likelihood is that the states of Southeast Asia will deal with this new external variable factor in a manner that conforms with the pattern of political behavior of the states of Southeast Asia going back even to the pre-colonial and pre-modern era. Geography and demography are, I believe, the two factors that have impacted the most, shaped the emergence of the Southeast Asian polities. And it will be seen from the map that Southeast Asia has always been exposed to external variable factors that no polity in Southeast Asia has been able to stop. Hence, the challenge of governance in this part of the world historically has always been how to brace itself against external variable factors. How and why um, the events that are taking place in North Africa should or would impact on Southeast Asia when talking about the impact of what's happening in North Africa on Southeast Asia, we need to also remember that there are broadly two Southeast Asias that we are talking about. And by this, I mean Muslim majority Southeast Asia. This would include countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, and Brunei. And then there is, of course, Muslim minority Southeast Asia, Singapore, Thailand, Philippines, Burma, Vietnam, and the impact of what's happening in the Arab Muslim world on Southeast Asia will therefore be somewhat differentiated as this phenomena is digested and internalized differently by 
different communities, there is some level, some horizontal level of contact whereby empathy, immediate empathy, uh, is there between Southeast Asians and other Muslims uh, beyond the region of Southeast Asia. I do not believe that any of the states of Southeast Asia are seriously delusional enough to think that they can present to the North Africans or the Arabs alternative models of governmentality. And as I said, Earlier, no state in Southeast Asia has attempted to do so. The events of North Africa are not entirely new to us, and because they are not entirely new to Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia is more than likely to behave in a typical and predictable manner as well. Thank you. Let me try and um, make my presentation through a story. The story which I promise to tell you is about three cities. This is my own journey in trying to understand the Arab Spring, trying to understand what the Muslims look for in terms of change and what holds for the future. And the three cities I have in mind, three T's actually, Tripoli, Tehran, and Turkey. In Tripoli, I found that there was a lot of hypocrisy then, in 1973. There were lots of double standards. And also in Tehran, it was pre-revolution. But we found that, in fact, at that time, we were wondering whether, in fact, that system could be sustained too. Then the revolution came in 1979, and it raised a lot of questions. Just like the Arab Spring of 2011, I think now it has raised a lot more questions than give us answers. And I think, with, as James said, it is now a period of wait and see. Because there are a lot more questions thrown about and we don't see answers as yet. What about Turkey? When I went to Turkey in, in the early 80s, it was also in search for that understanding. And the conclusion I came to very fast then was that Turkey was never the model for the Muslims then because it was seen as too liberal, too secular. But look at Turkey of today. In fact, you will find that more and more articles are being written about how the Muslim world and the Arab world included are turning to Turkey to see whether in fact it could be that model for the kind of change that the Muslim world is looking to. If you look at South Asia, for example, you also find similar challenges. In Malaysia, we have the AMNO ruling group of the Barisan National compared to the past group, which is in the opposition. They come with different history, with different expectations. But now they are work forming coalition to see how best they can move forward. Indonesia, I think uh, Dr. Farish Noor has also mentioned to you how complex the situation can be. But I think there lies the challenge for the Muslim groups and the non-Muslim groups among the Muslims in the Arab world and in other parts of the world to face that challenge squarely and actually come to some terms as to how best they could forge together a new, new alliances and new, co new uh, coalitions and move forward. Iran had the revolution which they thought would be a kind of a model for many of the Arab states. They have shown that what they have done through the revolution and bring about a kind of a people participation. So just to conclude, I would like to emphasize again that in fact the Arab Spring of last year indeed has brought forth the need for a more inclusive approach for the players in the Middle East and North Africa players among Muslims, Muslim groups, and Muslims and non-Muslims, and also players among Middle East countries and East Asia. Thank you.